Today, my team and I have challenged ourselves to explain some cardiology concepts at four levels of increasing complexity. Our topic, the mechanisms behind what makes the heart beat. We're going to talk you guys through how the heart beats from the macro level of the simple contraction of the chambers right down to the cellular mechanisms and channels involved. We'll also be using our expert, our paramedic, to talk about some of the most common diagnostic modalities used, as well as the most common pathological conditions that are seen during emergencies. Our goal is to help everyone understand what makes the heart beat at some level. Do you know what we're going to talk about today? The heart. The heart, that's right. Do you know where your heart is? In your stomach, it's like it's closer up here in between your lungs and it's close to the left side. How big do you think your heart is? That big? Make a fist like this. That's about how big your heart is. Do you know what the heart does? It helps the blood back up. That's right. It helps pump blood through the body and it helps so that your organs um, so that they're fed and so they work properly. So do you know how your heart moves the blood around the body? Okay, so do this. So make a fist like this. So your heart kind of squishes the blood. There's muscles and they push and there's, you know what cells are? So cells are really, really tiny and they make a bigger heart and it helps your heart push the blood through your body. And that's how the heart works. Good. Yeah. So today we're here to talk about the heart. Do you know where the heart is located? It's between your lungs and your chest. Yeah, exactly. So it's behind your sternum, but above your diaphragm. Do you know what size the heart is approximately? It's about the size of your fist, but generally probably a little bit bigger than that. Yeah, exactly. So an adult human heart weighs about 280 grams. Do you know what the function of the heart is? So the heart pumps blood throughout the body. There are two different circuits, the pulmonary circuit, in which it pumps blood between the lungs and the heart, and the systemic, in which it pumps blood between the heart and the rest of the body. Exactly. But do you know how it moves that blood? So the atria and the ventricles contract in order to push blood throughout the body. Yeah, so there are cells within the heart that generate an electrical impulse. It usually starts in the right atrium and it travels down through the atrium and through the ventricles. So the atria contract to push the blood into the ventricles and then the ventricles contract to push the blood to either the pulmonary or systemic circuit that you mentioned earlier. Today we're going to be talking about the heart and its function. Uh, do you know how it works? Yeah. So basic heart function is the atria and ventricles contracting and relaxing in a coordinated fashion, allowing blood to be pushed throughout the body and the lungs. And it works through electrical activity, which is started by action potentials and it coordinates the different pumping. Uh, do you know how these action potentials are propagated? Yeah, so there's a structure called the SA node and it's located in the right atrium. And it has a particular type of channel called HCN channels. And they allow for sodium to leak in, which allows for a spontaneous depolarization. And we sometimes call this the funny curve. And this is what starts the pacemaker potential. Then the action potentials propagate uh, fully through the atria, depolarizing the atria. And this is the stimulus for contraction of the atria. And then it will propagate to a structure called the atrioventricular node. Yeah, this uh, atrioventricular node slows down the conduction enough to allow the atria to contract and pump the blood to the ventricle. Yeah, and then it's going to spread through the septum, specifically through the uh, bundle of his, and then up through the Purkinje fibers, and then this allows the uh, ventricle to contract. Can you talk about what is contracting? and how that all works. Yeah, so when the depolarization is sweeping through the cardiac myocytes, it will cause sodium channels to open and these sodium channels will depol depolarize the cardiac myocyte, allowing by the influx of sodium. And once it reaches a threshold potential around negative 40 millivolts, um, there's another type of channel called L-type calcium channels will open allowing for an influx of calcium. And then this will, the membrane potential will be restored by the uh, efflux of potassium. Yeah, but that calcium that you just mentioned from the L-type calcium channels, 
isn't enough to cause contraction. It's just enough to trigger the opening of other um, calcium channels. Uh, and this is called calcium-induced calcium release. And there's these other type of channels within the cell, uh, specifically on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, reticulum called uh, ranidine receptors. And the calcium from the L-type calcium channels will come in, bind to the ranidine receptors, causing it to open, allowing all the calcium calcium within the sarcoplasmic reticulum to flow out and that calcium is required for the myofilament contraction. Uh, you just mentioned myofilaments there and contraction. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the myofilaments are just actin, myosin, and other proteins which are all interacting. And when calcium comes in, it will bind particularly uh, well to this protein called troponin, which is associated with actin. When the binding occurs, it will displace the troponin, which opens up the myosin binding site on actin, which allows actin and myosin interaction. And through the aid of ATP, we get this thing called the power stroke. What the power stroke is, is just the molecular mechanism of contraction. So today we are talking with Rick, an advanced care paramedic about cardiology. So uh, from your perspective, what are some of the most common cardiac events that you see in your job and how do you diagnose these and also how do you treat them before going to the hospital? To answer that, probably maybe it's just easy to, to divide it up into three segments. Uh, one would be actual heart attack. So if someone's having a heart attack, um, we base that on clinical judgment, um, clinical manifestations they're presenting with maybe chest pain, chest discomfort of some sort, um, as well as uh, maybe they're pale, cool, and sweaty, different symptoms. If someone does present like they may be having a heart attack, we will um, most commonly perform an ECG. Uh, 12 lead uh, is preferable. Uh, we do two lead quite on most people, but um, if we suspect something from that, we'll uh, proceed to a 12 lead and we look at different leads and see if there's any elevation, ST segment elevation, I think we talked about that. Um, and from there we uh, will often do a 15 lead ECG which basically checks the right side of the heart. The 12 lead checks more the left side of the heart uh, and the inferior components. Treatment wise, uh, important for sure um, if you suspect that you might be having a heart attack, uh, even before you call 911, uh, take two aspirin, then call 911. Uh, when we get there, we will assess further. We may give uh, what's called uh, nitroglycerin, which is a spray uh, under the tongue, which is a coronary vasodilator to help open up the heart a little bit, open up the vessels of the heart. We may also give uh, morphine, which is a um, narcotic opioid, has a couple of effects. It's also a vasodilator, which decreases uh, the afterload, decreases the work that our has, the heart has to do to pump blood out. And it also has an anxiolytic effect, which means um, it helps decrease people's anxiety. Uh, so we give, um, we give oxygen um, also. And if everything's working well, we will, if you're have, actually having a heart attack with us, we will actually take you directly to the uh, cath lab and quite often you will be on the surgical table in less than 90 minutes. Some of the other things that we see, so that's, that's actually a heart attack, but some of the other things we see, uh, maybe bradycardic rhythms or slow heart rates, uh, they can be caused from numerous uh, different things, uh, different heart blocks, first and second degree heart blocks, uh, third degree heart blocks, Sometimes the top of the heart is not functioning very well at all and uh, it's only the bottom of the heart that uh, is uh, uh, producing the rate. For different bradycardic rhythms, we give different medications. Again, oxygen is, is, a, big, is a key factor. We want to keep as much oxygen to the heart cells as possible. One of the other medicines we give is called atropine, which is a parasympatholytic, which basically means that it uh, acts opposite to the parasympathetic system. In the case of atropine, it takes the brakes off the heart and helps to help the heart speed up again. If 
atropine is not successful, we will quite often do uh, external cardiac pacing, um, which is basically um, providing energy shocks to the uh, person's heart uh, in a regular uh, rhythm at a pre prescribed rate, and hopefully to get the heart sped up again. Sometimes uh, neither one of those are successful, and we have another medicine called dopamine, which is a sympathomimetic, which basically means it acts uh, the same as the sympathetic nervous system. So in, in the case of the heart, dopamine means you step on the gas instead of where atropine was, you take if you, know, you step on the brakes or take the foot off the brakes. This, you're actually stepping on the gas to speed up the heart. So how would you diagnose? Uh, again, it looks, uh, you look at the, the person's uh, symptoms, how they're presenting. Uh, if they are have a low blood pressure, have a low heart rate, and they look unwell, that's pretty much the diagnosis. In as well as uh, the twelve lead, or the, even in that case, you could quite often tell with just a uh, uh, two lead or a three lead uh, ECG. So that's the bradycardic rhythms, and there's so many different causes. But um, also, then someone if they're in a cardiogenic shock because their heart's not beating fast enough, their blood pressure is too low, that's where we're more inclined to give the medicine uh, dopamine pre-hospitally. In the hospital they use other medicines, but that's the one we carry. Tachycardic rhythms maybe is, uh, is another one we deal with uh, commonly. Uh, we can have wide complex tachycardias, and wide complex basically means that it's coming from the ventricles of the heart. Uh, so wide complex could be uh, ventricular tachycardia. Sometimes you can have that with a pulse or without a pulse. So if they have it without a pulse, that's cardiac arrest, and we will do uh, defibrillation. Uh, if, it has, if they have a pulse, then we can uh, do synchronized cardioversion. We may also give medication for that. In the place where I work, we give lidocaine which is an antiarrhythmic medication and that help will hopefully help the heart uh, no longer be in this bad rhythm. Uh, sometimes uh, some other places give a medicine called amiodarone which is right now the preferred treatment but it's very expensive and not a good place carries it. And you can have narrow complex tachycardias. Most commonly one, there, there's uh, sinus tachycardia which most of us get if we do a little bit of exercise. And you can tell that on the 12 lead or even the two lead if there's a P wave and it's a narrow QRS complex. If there's no P wave and it's a narrow QRS complex, then you have to look, is it regular or is it irregular? If it's irregular, it's probably atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. But if it's regular, then we can we call a supraventricular tachycardia. For us, we look at the rate, and if it's over 150, and the person's still stable, so they have a good blood pressure, and they're not, they're, they might be presenting with a little bit of chest discomfort, and they might say their heart is palpitating. Um, if that's the case, then there's a medicine that we can give. Well, first, first we'll do, uh, preferred treatment right now is called a modified Valsalva maneuver. And we'll try that a couple of different times. Uh, and if that is not successful, then we will proceed to give uh, adenosine. Adenosine is, um, it basically stops the electrical system of the heart for a brief period of time in the hope that it will restart uh, in a more normalized rhythm. But, uh, those are some of the big ones that we, uh, we see fairly regularly. That was amazing. Thank you for your time. We think it's great for everyone to understand a little bit about what makes the heart function. Not just to understand a little bit more about what makes us as individuals tick, but because so many diseases stem from the inability of the heart to function properly.